Hello, everybody. Mike Nelson here with you. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. I want to thank everybody who's already uh, subscribed to the channel. Today, I got a pretty cool guest. We've got a Howard Johnson of a Dawn After Dark. How are you doing today, John Howard? I'm doing well, Mike. How are you? Doing pretty good. So, if you could talk to me a little about uh, Dawn After Dark. Um, of course, uh, the band uh, started way back in the 80s, but just released their uh, debut album a few years ago. Talk to me. Give me the story behind that. Yeah, it's got to be a record, hasn't it? I think, Mike, probably the longest Jeff Stating debut album of all time. That's um, great. <laughs> quick bit of history for you. Back in um, 1985, I was uh, a 21-year-old kid in Birmingham in uh, the industrial heartland of the UK, home to Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, and a whole host of hard rock bands. Um, and I was uh, writing for Kerrang! magazine, but I also had a burning desire to make music myself, um, and formed a band in uh, in Birmingham, name of Dawn After Dark. Uh, we started from nothing, rehearsing in an industrial unit, just like Black Sabbath had done before us, um, and started like all bands did at that time, by uh, gigging locally uh, in front of one man and his dog and slowly building up an audience at a time when there were places to play and, and people who used to go out and uh, listen to live music rather than spend all their day looking at a phone screen. So... Um, we we managed to secure a, a deal with a quite a well-known independent label in the UK called Chapter 22, which was kind of an interesting home for acts that didn't really fit in with any one particular style. Um, the bands that were assigned to the label kind of all had a rock history, but I think they were trying to do something different. So there was an alternative music scene, which was really starting in the UK at that time, featuring bands like The Cult and The Mission and New Model Army, Killing Joke. And um, I was very drawn to that scene as much as I was the traditional rock scene because it seemed to have the power and energy of rock music while trying to move the music form forward somewhat. So um, Dawn After Dark was kind of derived to be a band that, played like a traditional rock band, but listened to a lot of different kinds of music. Um, and we signed to Chapter 22, as I say, and um, over the course of the uh, 87, 88, 89, toured an awful lot in the UK, um, probably 150 to 200 shows, uh, released three 12-inch singles on the Chapter 22 label. And in 1990, um, we released our third 12-inch uh, Maximum Overdrive, which um, just so happened to be produced by Stevie Young of now ACDC fame. Wow. So um, we were featured in Kerrang! and featured in a lot of the more uh, alternative rock press titles in the UK. And as is often the way with young and stupid people, um, the band disintegrated in 1990 over various arguments that are uh, all seems slightly trivial now with the benefit of hindsight um, and the band and the band disintegrated and that was the end of that and I thought that would be um, Dawn After Dark consigned to the annals of history um, until 2019 four and a half years ago now when a promoter out of the blue got in contact with me uh, and was putting on a show in Birmingham with another band who'd been on the Chapter 22 label called Balaam and the Angel, who were good friends of ours. We'd toured with them a lot in the 80s um, and asked if the band would be interested in reforming in the classic Spinal Tap fashion. So um, <laughs> cut to about three months later and um, the band had been polished up and dusted off and we played the show in Birmingham. And uh, it was quite a revelation for us. It was a, a sold out show. Uh, lots of people had come from far and wide in the UK wearing their old Dawn After Dark T-shirts. And it was uh, it was quite the evening. And the self-same promoter um, also happened to be reviving the Chapter 22 label after 30 years. And so asked us if we would be interested in um, in recording a debut album that we'd never got round to doing in the 80s. So um, long story short, at the end of um, 2020, we were in the studio and, as you'll know, the results of that were the new Dawn Rising album, which came out at the end of 2021. And um, so here we are. We've been we've been gigging in the UK again. Um, the album 
uh, kind of scratched an itch that we really wanted to uh, wanted to scratch because we'd always felt that there was some unfinished business. And um, and here we are today with an album that we're very proud of. Now let's go back to the formation of uh, Dawn After Dark. Um, you know, forming the band in Birmingham almost, what is it, 20 years after uh, Black Sabbath. How was it like, you know, in, in the 80s already? Was, uh, was there any sort of, of metal scene uh, around in, in the UK kind of in that period? How was it like? I mean, it was a funny time for rock music in, in the UK. Um, if you go back and look at the press that was coming out of England at the time, Kerrang! magazine, the obsession wasn't really about what was happening in England. The new wave of British heavy metal had happened five years previously. Um, and really the focus had shifted to what was going on in America. You know, there was the whole kind of, you know, glammy, uh, over the top, very uh, technically proficient American rock music that was happening at the time. And I'd say the UK was a little bit in the doldrums as far as classic rock was concerned. And that was why my interest was piqued by those bands that were kind of coming out of what you might call the alternative scene there, that were still playing rock guitars, but doing things in a very different way. And, you know, like I said, bands like The Cult and The Mission, um, Fields of the Nephilim, New Model Army, those groups seemed to me to have the power of rock music while trying to develop something new and exciting. And I think really... Certainly my memories of going to clubs in Birmingham in the 80s, it wasn't about Judas Priest and Black Sabbath. It was really about those bands. Now, playing with uh, your band in, in that period, were you guys uh, doing a lot of, uh, you know, what, what type of shows were you guys doing? Were you guys opening mainly for bands or what, what was yeah, the, I mean, the You know, we, we, we did like? a, lot, a lot of opening shows for uh, a wide variety of bands, really, from well, Armony Angel, who I mentioned, who were good fans of ours. We did shows with New Model Army, as I mentioned. We played with Living Colour, uh, bands like Dogs de Moor, The Almighty. I mean, our, our kind of mantra was that we backed ourselves in any kind of environment so that we felt we could go on stage in front of anybody's audience and have an impact. Um, and I kind of liked the fact that we weren't just playing to the one audience because it, it tested you. It made you go out there and really have to work to um, to win people over. And I think, you know, to a certain extent, we did that. Probably you know, our, the highlight of our short career in that first time around was playing in London at the Marquee, selling out the Marquee Club, you know, the famous Marquee Club, probably about 800 people. Um it wasn't huge, but it kind of, you know, it, it made some ripples. And I think that um, we were trying to move the dial a little bit for rock music. And I guess we kind of did that. Now, when you finally got a chance to record your album all these years later, uh, were a lot of those ideas that you had for this record kind of developed uh, back in those days or were they kind of new ideas? Yeah, it was a mix of the two, really. Um, the, there was an We were very prolific as writers in that period. We had probably... 40 songs of which you know only nine or ten got released at that time and so um there was a wealth of material to draw on and when we got back together we started shifting through old tapes and having a listen to what we'd done and a lot of the material that ended up on the album was kind of a hybrid of, of ideas that we had at the time and then obviously updated to um to reflect how we'd changed as individuals and you know obviously we we're much older guys um, so what you hear on New Dawn Rising is really a kind of uh, a hybrid of ideas that we had in the 80s, in the late 80s, updated with a hopefully a more kind of, you know, a more mature and, and contemporary is probably not, not the right word because, you know, this is classic rock we're talking about, but um, a, sa a sound that did justice to where we were um, as older guys, you know, in the in the 2010s. Now, when the band was playing in the late eighties, was the goal to get signed by a major label? Um, or did you guys always kind of see yourselves of, of uh, getting signed by an independent label? How was it like, you know, back in those days? Well, we were signed to one of the bigger independent labels in the UK, as I said, in chapter 22, but I think every band had the dream of being signed to a major label because really being signed to a major was the only way that it was financially viable. You know, the UK is a small place, um, it doesn't have uh, the same culture of rock music being kind of mainstream that the States does. You obviously, you know, when the States 
uh, in the 1980s, the States was a place where rock music got played on the radio, on commercial radio all the time. Didn't happen in the UK. It was very underground, despite the fact that a magazine like Kerrang! was really punching above his weight and was very influential right across the world. The actual potential for bands to develop a career that could be financially sustainable was really kind of pretty small. So everybody's desire was to get signed to a major label. But part of the problem was that the UK didn't have that rock culture anymore. Um, you know, if you think about the bands that came after that initial burst of the new wave of British heavy metal, there wasn't a lot that came out of the UK in terms of traditional heavy bands that really made much of an impression. And I think that was a reflection of the fact that the industry wasn't really that motivated by rock bands. I think, you know, if I'd had my time again, I probably would have spent tried to spend some more time in the States because the States was more receptive to that kind of music. But, um, that you know, the, the idea was very much to sign to a major, but it wasn't to be. Now, you mentioned uh, Kerrang! the magazine. Talk to our viewers a little bit about your journalistic background because you, of course, uh, are a writer as well. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was a writer before I was a musician. So um, I was a very lucky young guy in the, at the age of 17. I'd been writing and producing my own fanzine and standing outside gigs and selling it. And um, and through sheer force of will and a, a lot of sending magazines through the mail and hassling journalists who were working on the national papers, I managed to manufacture myself a break on Kerrang!, um, very early doors in the within the first four or five issues of that magazine launching in uh, in 1981. So in 1982, when I was 17 years old, I got my break and started writing for Kerrang and and spent ten very happy years uh, getting treated like a king and sent all over the world to interview the bands that I'd grown up loving. So um, I was a very fortunate young guy that I was able to live my passion um, at a time when the music press was important. Um, you know, nowadays, you want to interview a band, you get a Zoom interview. Back in the day, record companies were paying to send you to the States, to Japan, to Australia. Um, and I got to really make the most of that. Never made any money, but <laughs> but I had a great time doing it. Now, what would, what would you say would be like your your favorite interview or maybe like a highlight of those uh, years of, of working for the magazine? I mean, there were a lot of highlights and they were kind of for different reasons. Uh, I was really lucky to go um, behind the Iron Curtain with Iron Maiden long before the, uh, the communist regimes of Eastern Europe had finished. In 1984, I went on the road with Maiden for about uh, 10 days in Poland, uh, Hungary, seeing, you know, really history being made because the, the Eastern Bloc was just starting to open up to Western culture and to be able to witness the passion of those fans to see, you know, rock music presented in a way that they'd really been starved of was incredible. So that was a real highlight. Um, going to Japan in 84, that same year as well, to do a story about the Japanese rock scene which was completely unknown in the UK at that time. Uh, and to spend two weeks in Tokyo uh, as the only kind of Western guy there um, and being looked after by entirely Japanese people and really getting to immerse myself in the culture of Japanese rock music, which I knew very little about. That was uh, a real eye opener and a, an incredible experience. And then from a musical point of view, um, getting to know um, the cult very early doors and being able to be in the studio while they were recording some of their great albums and become friendly with those guys and watch their evolution was a, a big musical highlight for me. So I guess, you know, you can pick a lot of different reasons uh, that made particular trips or particular interviews special. But I guess those are three off the top of my head that that really made a lasting impression on me. Now, what do you think happened? Of course, uh, as we know, like rock and metal is, is is still very popular around the world, but in some ways, it's it's kind of gone like underground. What do you, what do you think uh, changed um, for for those genres of music? What what happened to it? Why is it kind of underground now, not mainstream like before? I think it's um, it's down to a lot of factors. There are there are certain factors about the evolution of the music industry that I think have driven 
more uh, niche kinds of music underground because of streaming. Um, there are so few opportunities now for bands that don't fit what you would kind of call a real commercial imperative to be able to develop. Rock bands traditionally took a long time before they could, you know, develop the sales bases that would really give the record companies their financial returns. I think there is no longer the appetite for that kind of long-term development of bands. Um, streaming hasn't helped because the, tri the pyramid of how music works has been narrowed more and more because streaming rewards a very small number of acts who have enormous global reach. So as when in the 80s, a band like Guns N' Roses could sell 10 million albums and be one of the most important bands in the world. Nowadays, obviously, the potential for the top artists is unbelievable. It's in the billions of streams. But what happens is because music has become so kind of polarised, enormous, enormous success at the top of the pile and very little success at the bottom, it's it's kind of narrowed everything down. There was a there was a space for a lot more artists to make a living in the eighties. Nowadays, you know, you, there are probably what ten global acts that are really making enormous amounts of money out of Spotify and bands who would have been able to at least make a living in the eighties are now finding it increasingly difficult at the bottom of the pile. I think that's had a, a negative influence on rock music. I also think that there is a reality that, you know, people need to face up to that rock music is not the music of choice for many young people these days. They, you know, they want to listen to a lot of dance music or, you know, whatever you call it, EDM or, or pop music or, or there's, there's a, there's a, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the 10 biggest streaming bands today, I doubt there'll be any heavy rock bands in there. Whereas in, in the eighties, the biggest selling albums in the world would feature, you know, probably 50% of them be rock albums. So I think there's a, there's a reality that people, you know, have to accept now that um, rock is more of a minority sport than it was, which doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, many hundreds of thousands, millions of rock fans out there, but the bands will find it hard to make, the money they need to survive because streaming is not going to give it to them. And so that kind of relationship that existed between the bands on the lower rungs of the ladder when I was growing up has really been broken. And, you know, we see it all the time that um, bands are now you know, having to charge exorbitant prices for merchandise just to keep themselves on the road. They have to make money out of being, of playing live, whereas money from, uh, it wasn't a priority for live music in the eighties that the live shows was a loss leader to encourage people to buy albums. Now that doesn't exist anymore because everyone's streaming. Um, and I think there's, there's also been uh, another element of the equation for me in the partly due to streaming and the difficulty to, to sustain rock bands, but partly just due to the fact that things have moved on where are the new global hard rock bands that have, you know, taken over from Guns N' Roses and Metallica and Kiss and Aerosmith and ACDC and all those bands? There's been a a bit of a, you know, a bit of a wasteland of, of there hasn't been any bands that have really been able to come through and become that big and sustain for that long. I mean, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something, but I don't see... I don't see the the bands that are, you know, the next generation of heavy rock bands coming through to replace those things. You know, if you were if you were to talk to promoters now, who are the heavy rock bands you'd most want to book in the world? It'd probably still be Metallica, wouldn't it? Because <laughs> that's that's the big revenue generator. So somewhere along the line, and for whatever reasons, the world hasn't produced hard rock bands that can aspire to that level of success. Now, 
talk to me a little about uh, what you're up to right now, of course, with the uh, Rock Candy magazine. Can you talk to me a little about that magazine? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? I'm a I'm a man of many of many hats. Um, <laughs> Rock, Rock Candy magazine was uh, the brainchild of uh, three ex Kerrang alumni from the '80s, um, myself, Derek Oliver, and Malcolm Dome. Um, we were kind of looking at the landscape for rock music, um, as we've just discussed, and really thinking that there wasn't anything now out there that serviced what we felt guys of our age who were still passionate about rock music wanted to read about. Um, and I guess that Rock Candy was designed to try and cater for people who were nostalgic for the good old days of Kerrang! When you got excited about getting a magazine once a week and finding out the information about people who really weren't being covered anywhere else, but to do it in a way that reflected the fact that we were all a little older and hopefully a little wiser. So, you know, to go in depth on those bands. And, and it seemed to me interesting that we could go and revisit rock bands from those 70s and 80s glory days and talk to the musicians who then had 30 years more experience and were much more mature individuals and with less of a kind of an agenda because obviously in the 80s everybody was bigging themselves up and telling us they were going to be the next great thing and all the rest of it and now we can talk to those guys with a sense of perspective and I find it really interesting that what we tend to do with rock candy is go deep into our subject matter um, and hopefully ask the kind of questions that shed some light on what the reality was and is of playing in those bands rather than kind of, you know, young testosterone filled PR hype, which probably you look back on some of the stuff that was in Kerrang at the time, probably a fairly apt description of it. So you know, we wanted to do it in a way that was kind of old school. So printing it like good old, you know, rock magazines used to be and and make use of the fantastic imagery that the 80s provided with the, you know, with the extreme looks that those groups had and hopefully approach that music with a kind of a, an obvious love for it, but also um, added to that a sense of understanding and perspective and a little bit more in-depth knowledge of what the realities were of being in those bands and try and explain that to um to our readers and you know i i hope that not only does it appeal to people who were there at the time like me but also to younger guys like you who didn't mm. live it but maybe feel some kind of kinship to what went on then now where can people find this uh, magazine for us that want to read the magazine or articles where, where can we find this well we're, we're distributed worldwide, so in the States, you can find it in Barnes & Noble shops for sure. Um, and obviously, we have an online presence at www.rockcandymag.com where you can find out all the information about um, the back issues that we've still got available, what the current issue holds. You can sample some articles to give you a flavour of what the magazine's about. Uh, and obviously there is also the opportunity because we're not total Luddites to subscribe to a digital um, subscription if that's what people prefer. So really the best place to start is at rockcandymag.com and follow your nose from there. Now, how's it been? Of course, uh, you talked about how, you know, working in the 80s as a journalist, it was a lot different. You had a chance to do a lot of in-person interviews. Talk to me a little about how that's, of course, changed now, you know, making a magazine in, in uh, the 21st century uh, outside of just doing Zoom interviews. How's it different now, you know, being a journalist in comparison to back then? I think, I think the really biggest difference is that um, you obviously aren't getting sent around the world interviewing bands anymore. So you lack that kind of ability to get to know your subject matter because back in the day, you'd go on the road and you were out on the road for a week at a time. You get to know people before you had to kind of write your articles and everybody's become a lot more protective of their brand values and their image these days. They don't want journalists to get close to them. They certainly don't want you to be able to lift the veil and see what's going on behind the curtain. And so I think that, you know, if you're, 
if you're trying to find out about the big artists of today and what they're really like and what they really think and feel, it's going to be difficult for you. The advantage that we have with Rock Candy is that we have a relationship with a lot of those guys that goes back 30 years, 40 years. And so when we're in contact with them, there's a certain level of trust that we've established over a long time. So hopefully we get around that problem of not being able to penetrate that wall of kind of, you know, what the band is presenting to the world rather than the realities of what they are. And I hope that's something that we managed to um, get around. But I think um, what's difficult, what's different now is that, you know, you're doing everything pretty much by Zoom. You're not, you're not out on the road, you know, living in the pockets of these guys. Well, I want to thank you, Howard, for your time. It was uh, great uh, talking to you today. No problem. It's good to talk to you. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Remember to stay heavy.